Well, good morning, and, and what an appropriate song uh, to lead us into our, our time of digging into God's Word together. And uh, my name is Bobby Van Dyne, and I have the, the awesome privilege of being able to serve here as the Senior Director of Ministry, and I, I certainly count it a privilege to be teaching this morning and to be pinch-hitting for Pastor Bob. I'm, I'm very grateful that he is getting some really well-deserved time away, some time of Sabbath, where he can allow God to really pour into him so that he can continue to pour into all of us and lead St. Paul Church to where God would have us to go. And I just want you to know that, that any time I've ever had the opportunity to teach God's Word, whether it was in my student ministry days or when I've taught in the fountain, I just feel, I feel the weight, I feel the responsibility of trying to accurately teach God's Word. And so before we go any further, I'm just going to ask that we might pray together and uh, ask God to, to really speak to us through His Word today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that, that really you would just decrease my presence here, that you would increase your presence, Lord, and I just pray that everybody in this room might collide with you, that we might encounter your Holy Spirit and be changed and transformed. Lord, would you just prepare our hearts and minds to receive whatever it is that you have for us today, and Lord, we just pray that we might not just be hearers of this word, but that we might put it into action and be doers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 today. So if you brought a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 9. And, and while you're flipping there, find uh, verse 1. And, and while you're turning, uh, let me kind of set the stage as to where we're going to go with the message today. Uh, and, and to do so, I kind of want to bring you back to maybe your, your high school or your college physics class, which... I know it might be a stretch. It is for me. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about my physics class, but I do remember my, my teacher and my professor trying to teach us about the basic laws of motion, right? And Newton's first law of motion, it goes something like this, that an object in motion, it tends to stay in motion, going on, uh, on a certain speed in a certain direction, and an object at rest, it tends to stay at rest, unless, unless it's acted upon by an unbalanced external force. And, and I want to submit to us today that our lives are, are very similar to that law of motion, that we tend to be tracking along, kind of going in our own direction, maybe with our own purpose, our own agenda, with our own destination. Or, or maybe we feel like our life is just stuck. Maybe we just feel like no matter what we do, no matter what we acquire, no matter what we attain, we come up just feeling empty, that there's got to be more to life. And then for many, many, many of us in this room, we've had a, a life-changing experience, an experience that changed our course. We've collided with Jesus. We've given our heart. We've surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. And he gave us a new trajectory, a new path. He gave us a new purpose and a new destination. And so that's what we want to look at today. And that's what we want to celebrate today. And certainly, all throughout the scriptures, we see examples of Jesus colliding with people. Right? If you think about uh, as he calls his disciples, he comes and he, he connects with these, these men and, and they literally, they leave their previous lifestyles behind. They, they leave their careers as fishermen and, and they leave their careers as tax collectors all to follow after this man, Jesus. And, and we certainly, we see it in examples of uh, the, the many miracles, the many healings where Jesus lays his hands on people and physically and spiritually heals people and, and their lives are forever changed. We see it in the example of the woman who was caught in adultery, right? The, the crowd and the religious leaders bring her to Jesus and they say, look, the law says that she should be stoned to death. Teacher, what do you say? And Jesus, he just puts the whole crowd in checkmate with a couple words. He just says, all right, whoever here in the crowd has no sin in your life, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And one by one, they, they drop their stones and they walk away. And it's just Jesus and this woman. And he says to her, look, there's no one here who condemns you. And neither do I. So go and, and leave this life of sin. And her life is forever changed in that moment. Well, today what we want to look at is maybe the most dramatic example of a collision with Jesus. The most dramatic example of life change. And that's the story of the Apostle Paul. You might be new to church, you might be new to the scriptures, so let me tell you about Paul a little bit. Uh, he's a big deal to the Christian faith. You see, after Jesus was crucified, dead, and, and buried, on the third day he is resurrected, and ultimately he ascends into heaven. 
He sends his Holy Spirit at Pentecost to birth the church. And not long after that, this man, Paul, rises up and carries the torch and, and brings the gospel all over the, the known world at that time. He brings it all over the kind of the Mediterranean Sea, all over the Roman Empire. And along the way, as he stops, he plants all these little churches. And in fact, if you read in the New Testament, he, he's credited with writing 13 books in the New Testament. And really, they're not so much books as they are letters back to those churches. So the, the book of Ephesians is a letter to the church at Ephesus. The book of First and Second Corinthians are letters to the church at Corinth. And so Paul, he's, he's a really big deal to our faith. But what you need to know is that Paul, he wasn't always this incredible godly man. He wasn't always this advancer of the gospel. In fact, if we flash back to a, a previous season in his life, we find out that he was really the exact opposite that he was a persecutor of the church. And that's where we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And just so that we're all on the same page here, when we see Saul, Saul and Paul are the same person. Saul is his Hebrew name. Uh, he's a Jewish Pharisee. Paul, he was also a, a Roman citizen, so Paul is his Latin name. He, he would later adopt this name as he goes to bring the gospel to the Gentile audience. So, so Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So there's kind of a lot going on here. Uh, Saul he, he's kind of this high-ranking Pharisee. The scriptures tell us that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, meaning he comes from a long line of Pharisees, that he was uh, high-ranking, you know, that he comes from the tribe of Benjamin, which is, you know, the most prestigious tribe to come from, that he was circumcised on the right day. To the letter of the law, he lived his life. And, and he goes uh, to the, the high priest and he says, I, I want permission to go all the way to Damascus, which is about 175 miles north of Jerusalem. And if I find anybody there who was a follower of the way, which is what the, the early church was called at that time. Before they were called Christians, they were followers of the way. And it makes sense, right? Because Jesus often taught that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And so he says, you know, if, if I find any of these people, I, I want to be able to, to imprison them and, and have them tried and ultimately put to death. See, to put, today, to put Paul in today's con, uh, context, you can think of him really as a, a religious terrorist. He, he is literally trying to stamp out this movement because he believes that the way is uh, a dangerous cult that is going to be detrimental to the Jewish faith. Verse 3, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So he sees this bright light and he hears this voice from heaven saying, Saul, why do you persecute me? To which Saul likely would have been thinking, you know, God, I'm not persecuting you. I'm on, I'm on your team, God. I'm persecuting these heretics. I'm persecuting th this cult. But what we see here is that, that God is saying that whenever you persecute the body of Christ, you're literally persecuting Jesus himself. That whatever you do to Christ's representation here on earth, you do to Jesus. And, and that is certainly consistent all throughout the scriptures, right? If you go back to Matthew chapter 25, you, you hear Jesus teach that whatever you have done, for the least of these brothers of mine, whether you fed them, whether you clothed them, whether you went to visit them in prison, you, you've done this for me as well. Verse 5, who are you, Lord? Saul asked, which is kind of an interesting question. He kind of answers his own question, doesn't he? He's kind of connecting the dots, you know, bright light, voice from heaven. Uh, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So literally, Paul is, is blinded by this light. It says, so they led him, to the hand, uh, led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So it's as if Jesus, he's just had enough of the persecution, and he decides all right, so I'm going to take you out of the equation. I'm going to stick you in time out over here for a while. He's blinded him. He goes without food for three days. In verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision 
Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So this man, Ananias, he's having this incredible supernatural vision and conversation with God. And God is very, very specific with him. He says, Ananias, I want you to go to Straight Street. And there you're going to find a house uh, owned by Judas. And in that house is a man named Saul who is blind. But you, you're going to go and you're going to lay your hands on him and he's going to uh, receive his sight again. Ananias replies in verse 13, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. And, and i got to tell you, I'm kind of convicted about the way Ananias responds because it's often how I respond to God, right? Again, he's having this supernatural vision and conversation with God, and, and he feels the need, like I do sometimes, to fill God in on what's going on, right? Lord, I, I don't know if you know this, but Saul, you know, he doesn't like people like me, and likely he's going to try to imprison me or persecute me. And, and I often do that in my prayer time, too. I feel like I need to let God know, and I just feel like He's just shaking his head like, really, Bobby? Like, really? I, I'm the almighty creator of heaven and earth. I'm all-knowing. I'm all-powerful. I'm everywhere present. Like, I know. I, I got this, you know? And, and in verse 15, the Lord says to Ananias, go. And I think he said it with some emphasis there. There's an exclamation after that, go. And, and I can't help but kind of be drawn back to uh, parenting my, my seven-year-old and my four-year-old right now. And after about the, the fifth time of saying, hey, you know, it's time for you to go and, and clean up your room, or it's time for you to get ready to go to bed now, and my seven-year-old kind of responding like, Dad, I don't know if you know this, but I'm seven year, years old now. I got a lot of wisdom under my belt, and I think I would be much better served to, to watch cartoons for the next couple hours. And so, and, and then you just kind of, you get in this debate, and you're just at the point where you're just like, all right, no more conversation. Go. You need to go. He says, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There's a lot to take away from that part right there. First of all, what we take away is that there's nobody here who is beyond the saving power of the cross, beyond the saving power of Jesus Christ. No matter what your past, no matter what you've done, if he can save a man like Saul who is persecuting the church and killing Christians, he can certainly save us from whatever our background is, whatever our history is. And he, and he says that he is his chosen instrument to take the gospel all the way to the Gentiles. That God would choose Saul to be his chosen instrument. And, and I want to suggest to you that, that God chooses you, he chooses me sometimes, to be his chosen instrument to share his name, maybe to somebody in your family, to share the gospel to somebody at your place of employment, to share the gospel in your schools. And what an honor, what a privilege it is that he might say that today you're going to be my chosen instrument to share my name. Verse 16 says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And if you've not read the rest of the book of Acts, I encourage you to do so. And you'll see that, that Saul, he, he really does suffer a great deal. He's beaten and put in prison for sharing the gospel but he is, he's undeterred. There's nothing that anybody can seemingly do to stop him from his mission. He's just relentless in sharing the gospel. In fact, he says things in the scriptures like, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Meaning that if you kill me, great. I will, I will be face to face with my Lord Jesus and it'll be awesome. But if you let me live, I'm going to keep preaching Jesus all day long and there's nothing you can do about it. So, so what do you do with a guy who's that sold out? Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. And, and you got to imagine how nervous is Ananias at this point where he walks into the house and comes face to face with Saul, knowing his background, knowing his history, and knowing what might happen. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice the language he uses here. He calls him Brother. And that's another huge takeaway for us as a church that when somebody comes through our doors, right, regardless of their past, regardless of what they might look like, they've got to be treated as a brother or sister in Christ. They've got to be 
uh, feeling loved and welcomed by the body of Christ. Verse 17, Then Ananias went to the house and entered, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So it's as if Jesus, you know, he puts him in time out. He blinds him. He kind of breaks him down. And now he is restoring him. He is repurposing him. He is collided with him and he is changing his course. He is changing him into the man that he is ultimately going to be. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Verse 20, at, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. So right after he has this conversion, right after he is baptized and regains his strength, he starts telling everybody who will listen that Jesus is the Son of God. And we see that to hold true here in our church and in most churches, that people who have recently collided with Jesus, recently surrendered their heart to Jesus, are the ones who are most on fire about witnessing and sharing the gospel and inviting people to church, right? And usually they don't even have much knowledge of the scriptures yet. They're just like, you know, all I know is I was doing this and somebody introduced me to Jesus. He got a hold of my life and everything is changing and I want you to come and meet my Jesus. I want you to come to church and worship this Jesus. And my question to the rest of us who maybe have been around for a while, maybe it's been a while since we uh, collided with Jesus, do we need to be reignited in our passion to share the gospel with other people? Do we need to remember all that God has saved us from, all the things that he has forgiven us of so that we might have a, a greater sense of urgency to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Verse 21, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? among those who call on this name, and hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So as he's preaching and living his life in Damascus, all the people, all the crowds are like, whoa, whoa, this doesn't seem to add up. Like, isn't he the guy who just a couple weeks ago was trying to persecute all of us and, and was coming after us? And now he's like loving and serving and, and preaching the name of Jesus. To which I would say, the greatest witnessing tool we have is the example of our changed life. Right? When people see us all of a sudden carrying ourselves differently, when people see us uh, speaking differently, when people see us loving and serving and giving of our time and our resources, they're like, you know, that doesn't add up. That's not the guy you used to be. And you're like, I know, right? I know God has gotten a hold of me and let me, let me show you, let me introduce you to my Savior. And it says in verse 22 that he was proving that Jesus is the Christ. You know, Saul, he, he was very well educated, knew the scriptures forwards and backwards. And, and I want to encourage us to continue to dig deep into God's word, to know God's word so that we can defend our faith. So that when somebody asks, why do you believe what you believe? That, that you, you would have an answer, that you would be able to point them to scripture Kind of the big church word is apologetics. It just means to be able to defend your faith. Verse 23. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. It's kind of ironic, right, that the, the man who was pursuing people of the way, trying to persecute them and have them killed, is now on the run for his own life. And it's even more interesting because, you know, he, he's walked in, in these persecutors' shoes. He knows kind of exactly how they might plan this attack. And so he, he's like, no, no problem, just lower me down in the basket and I'll get on out of here. Um, and, and what I want to suggest to us today is that oftentimes whatever God has saved you out of, he will use you right back in that same arena to help somebody else break through and to come through the same struggles that you had, right? Because who better to reach that person than somebody who's walked in their shoes? Who better to reach that person than somebody who knows all the excuses, knows all the justifications, right? So be on the lookout for that. Whatever God might free you from, whatever habits, hang-ups, whatever addictions, a lot of times he will use you to help somebody who is walking in those same shoes that you used to walk in. Verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, 
He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So he travels the 175 miles all the way back to Jerusalem, and he wants to connect with the disciples there. And the disciples there are like, whoa, whoa, you're, you're not coming to our church, right? Like, we know about your past. We, we, we think we know who you are. Verse 27, but Barnabas. Barnabas took him and, and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So this man Barnabas, whose name literally means the son of encouragement, he goes to bat for Saul. He says, no, 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 guys, Saul is with me. He belongs. He's one of us. And I want to submit to us today that, that we need a church full of Barnabases. We need a church that when somebody comes through our doors, again, regardless of their past, regardless of their history, regardless of what they look like, that there will be countless people who would welcome them and, and say, look, we've saved a seat for you. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here because think about it. That person might be here for the very first time and, and first impressions are a big deal. Or, or maybe, um, maybe they're giving church uh, a second and last chance. Maybe they've had a bad experience at the church and they're like, I'm going to give it one more shot. And so we need people to surround them with love and make them feel loved and welcomed in this place. Verse 28, So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they, they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So again, he's on the run for his life and and his brothers send him back to his hometown of Tarsus. Verse 31, that the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. So the church endures this great time of peace. One of the big components, obviously, is that the, the main persecutor has switched teams, has converted, right? But, but that is certainly my prayer for our church and for the church universal, that we would enjoy a time of peace, that we would be encouraged by the Holy Spirit, that we would grow in numbers as we live in the fear of the Lord, as we live in awe and respect and reverence of the Almighty King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Well, well today we're going to close the message time a little bit differently. I want to give you the, the opportunity to, to respond to what God may be doing in your life today. I want to give you the opportunity. Maybe today you've had a collision with the Savior. Maybe he's just working on your heart and, and you just know that you need to take the next step, that, that you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ in this moment. And so I'm just going to ask that everybody would bow your heads and we're going to have a, a time of prayer together this morning. And if that's you, if you say, you know, today I want to surrender my life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to pray a, a very simple prayer with me. I want you to know that it's not... The specific words, they're not special words, but what's happening in this moment is that you are surrendering your heart and your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Would you just pray something like this? Lord, I know that I've missed the mark. I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I believe with all my heart that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to, to go to the cross, to stand in my place, to pay my debt, so that I might have forgiveness of my sins. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. And today, Lord, I just surrender it all to you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. And from this day forward, Lord, I just pray that you would be my Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask us to respond in one more way today. As you came in, you should have received a card that at the top of it says before and on the bottom it says now. And hopefully you received a pen or a pencil as well. And we're just going to enter into a time of, of celebration and, and worship kind of silently here. And I'm going to ask you to, to write who you were before you had a collision with Jesus. Kind of describe the path that you were on, the things that uh, maybe plagued you, the, the habits, the things that, that maybe you're not real proud of. And, and then on the bottom... I want you to describe who you are becoming now. The life change that, that God has brought to your life, the things that he's freed you from, the habits that he's broken, the addictions that he's freed you from. And, and certainly, we all, we're all on a long journey. We all 
are a work in progress and are continuing to be sanctified and have a long way to go, but there's much, much, much to celebrate. And so we want to take some time. I'm just going to give you some time to respond. And, and I would ask that you don't write your name on this, but that you would just spend some time writing this and, and meditating and thanking God, praising God, worshiping God for what he's done in your life. And then you can come to the altar and, and pray about this if you'd like, or you can pray in your seats. But I was asked that you would leave these cards with us, that you would leave them at the altar, that you would leave them with the ushers on the way out. We want to collect these cards after the service and, and kind of create something visually that would just show the incredible life change that God has done in our midst. And so would you just take some time to pray and worship and reflect on how good God has been to you? And, and then David will continue to lead us in our worship time.